good afternoon all. My name is Jim Laird. Uh, I am the CEO of Enough, and Enough is a coordinator for one of the flagship projects, Project Plenitude. Um, and we are immensely grateful to Lise, Louisa and to Circular Biobased Europe JU for their support, and also for outlining the aims of CBE JU, which we fully support and applaud. I start by thanking you, Gerard, and to Bridge to Food for this opportunity to speak today. Uh, in my title here, I very deliberately refer to the market for protein rather than just microprotein because the aims of plenitude address the food protein market and the need for sustainable protein in its very much in its widest definition. And to introduce you to plenitude, it's, uh, it, it was the 14th flagship project. As Louisa says, we are now to 18 and it's the 14th pro project awarded by CBEJU or its predecessor, BBIJU. And you'll, feel, you'll find details of this project on the website shown, and, uh, and I have a privilege to give you some more headlines today. Um, it is my pleasure to talk about how Plenitude addresses the future of protein, and I do it as one part and just a very small part of a very strong project consortium comprising 11 partners, all of whom I believe are instantly recognisable by their logos shown here. The Plenitude project was awarded in mid-2019, and it commenced in October 2019 and overall it will run through five and a half years up until March 2024. And now as with all of the all flagship projects it includes a value chain approach and you see here the consortium partners we have 11 partners across five EU member states and with a strong mix of large and small companies and all parts of the value chain are covered within that consortium. Enough is the coordinator for the consortium and the goals of plenitude align very strongly with the purpose of enough of enough, which is to make protein more sustainable. Now, amongst the 14 flagships shown on this page, uh, Plenitude is special for many reasons. I think all flagships have uh, received very high levels of grant intervention, are multinational in their nature, and they're part of making the bioeconomy. Now, Plenitude is unique because it's the only flagship that addresses food, and this has become or of increasingly high profile and, and of global significance. I think COVID-19 has highlighted the pressures on global supply chains and further increased the profile of food security. So really in a summary, Plenitude seeks to make high scale impact across the uh, dimensions of nutrition and of sustainability. And we address a market which is close to all of our hearts and which is both vast and continuing to grow very rapidly. The objectives of Plenitude are to create new bio-based products and new bio-based value chains. And we, we're making good progress in this with some of the uh, opportunities shown on this page. And I come on to talk about that. But in order to contextualize the future of protein, I'd like to start by looking at the protein market. The protein market is almost 600 million tons per year. And that's based on 8 billion of us consuming almost 75 or an, or an average of 75 kilograms of protein per capita on an individual basis. And if we believe much of the data from experts such as McKinsey, BCG, there is a very large gap in the solution to supply sustainable protein. The market is growing at a rate of about 45,000 tonnes every day, with two thirds of that coming from animal sources and one third from non-animal sources. And I think neither of these options is currently either truly sustainable or scalable. But we strongly believe, and I hope to come on and explain, that fermentation and microprotein are a key part of addressing that, th this challenges problem. And the continuing scale of the market is highlighted by the fact that in the next decade, it will increase by almost 100 million tonnes as we get a bigger population and as we all turn to higher and higher consumptions of protein. And whilst intensive animal farming has in the past shown its ability to increase in scale, the challenges of animal farming are also widely acknowledged. So within the non-animal sector, the ability to increase by 50 million tonnes within a decade, or 15,000 tonnes every day, is currently a supply chain challenge or an unmet need. This chart, the chart shown here is from analysis from BCG, and it shows how alternative protein, which currently accounts for about 2% of the market, 
but it, but it shows a projection that by 2030, a little less than 3,000 days away, it will increase to by about fourfold to 8% of the market. This will increase by 52 million tonnes, an overall increase of 17% every year. And if we look specifically to fermented protein or microprotein, the growth rate that is estimated is much higher, growing at 75% per year, with a startling figure of an additional 4,000 tonnes of available new supply every day for the next 3,000 days. So we have the challenge, and looking at these numbers, it is challenging, I think it's important, but I think it's important to put in context the commitments that are made by our global leaders. As a company founded in Glasgow, Enough 3F Bio, we welcomed some of the commitments made in November of last year at COP26. Most notably, we applaud the pledge to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. I'd have to say it's a big task, uh, and it's only it will only be achieved by rethinking the future of protein. Both renewable energy and producing protein using animals are massive contributors to environmental emissions. And we're coincident coincidentally, they each account for roughly a third of, of methane emissions. Therefore, if we were to achieve this pledge, which has been committed to by world leaders, it would mean that either the full removal of emissions from energy or also or all of those from livestock. In 2019, renewable energy received $300 billion of investor funding. And with the investor funding in place and the commitment from governments to reduce the use of fossil fuels, the path for transforming energy emissions in that sector has started. I think the journey for changing our food system is still at a relatively earlier stage. The investment number in alternative protein in the same year was $3 billion rather than the $300 billion. But it's very apparent that even if governments are slow to act, the ESG, then ESG investors will fill this void. And I'd say if we do not achieve a protein transition, then regrettably the minus 30% pledge would remain, as Greta would say, simply blah, blah, blah. If you can accommodate me, I'll also I'll highlight some of the aims of Enough, uh, where we believe we can at least help to address unmet need. And we do so by building the world's largest new protein facility, new protein of any of any type and any any format. Enough's goal is to produce a million tons of sustainable protein by 2032, which is within 10 years of our first production plan for later this year. Uh, I think we get better get moving. Uh, and most importantly, we only do this if we can make delicious vegan foods that consumers love and that is both convenient and cost competitive. And we address this by growing protein that uses less resources than any other protein options. If we do this at scale, we'll address many of society's biggest priorities. And this is aligned with many of the UN's SDGs, notably addressing hunger, addressing climate change and developing a more secure food system. Now, for the purposes of time, I'm only going to provide a super summarized explanation of the process of growing microprotein. But as some reference points, you'll be, you will be reassured that we are not alone in believing in the merits of fermentation. And I'm glad some of the people on this chart are on the call today. There's a growing number of companies in this space, and I presume that most of you are familiar with Quorn, who pioneered the fermentation sector, and also some very well funded others, such as Tomasek, Nature's Find, Perfect Day. Now, amongst these high profile peers, enough is relatively advanced and we plan to be operational at scale later this year. Before talking about scale, which I enjoy, to explain briefly what we do, we convert any locally sourced fermentable sugar. We take it through a fermentation space and large scale fermentation to convert those sugars into whole biomass, which contains both fiber and protein. And this has applications in a very wide range of food formats. And we do this with a proprietary IP that creates a zero waste process. To look at the product, we uh, and its raw state, a bundle looks a little bit like uh, a bread dough, as you can see at the top hand, the top right of this page. It's pale in color and it's got a consistency, a bit like a chicken mince or a bread dough. Now it's advantage relative to the full range of other protein sources in terms of sustainability and in its efficient use of land and water and also low CO2 emissions. Nutritionally, it contains both protein and fiber, and importantly, all of the amino acids and, and its versatility in product applications. In contrast to some of the names in the prior chart, 
enough do this on a B2B basis, supplying bulk in bulk as, as shown on the bottom right. Now there are a whole range of potential market applications and we address this with a full range of B2B partners, a fundamental belief in collaboration and with customers. And that includes the absolute strength from within this, courtium, within this consortium. And whilst we'll explore all potential applications, it's also true that scale of demand in meat alternatives and seafood with fish alternatives alone would readily consume our initial capacity. But as part of the consortium, we absolutely enthuse about demonstrating the opportunity for bio-based solutions in some of these other markets further to the right. Many of the audience may be familiar with XPRIZE, where the current XPRIZE challenge is to produce whole muscle chicken or fish. And as, as one example of the merits of microprotein, we're pleased to have, been, to have been announced as one of the semi-finalists in this competition. If anyone has time later, there's a, a YouTube link to our XPRIZE application, which describes our plan to make a chi vegan chicken breast every second. Now that message of scale is something which within plenitude we will talk about repeatedly. And therefore I'd like to move on to our operational plans and our drive for scale. Within our operational plan, we're currently building what we understand to be the largest non-animal protein factory anywhere globally. Within five years, we expect to be producing a cow's worth of protein every two minutes, 30 cows equivalent per hour. Put it in context, this is more than the annual production from the entire Scottish beef industry. And we're building this in the south of the Netherlands, where we are co-locating a facility owned by Cargill, one of our consortium partners, that converts maize into fermentable sugar. By sitting on the cargo facility in Sass van Ghent, we co-located between a starch plant at the south end of the plant and an ethanol bioethanol refinery in the middle of the plant. And by situating the middle, we enable our efficient zero waste process. In the picture you see here, we have utilities and nutrient preps down the left-hand side of the plant and a building which will accommodate roughly 20,000 tonnes of initial capacity and which has a footprint and a scale or in the land to scale to 60,000 tonnes. What you're seeing is a flyby. At this stage, we're making some very strong progress in construction activities, and most of the tanks that you're seeing down the right-hand side are, have been installed during the course of this month. I am tempted to leave that running. In the interest of time, I'll move us forward. Try and move us forward. Um, and talk about the reason we do this. And the reason we do this is because it creates impact at scale. Most of the alternative protein options are advantaged relative to animal on a kilogram per kilogram basis. Now the enough team are excited to progress this because by making food that consumers love and therefore thereby achieving the scale we will materially impact on a, on a massive market. For enough, the principle of scale is crucially important because only with scale we will make impact and the core impact is in terms of realizing the aims of a sustainable protein transition. In metrics, reducing water use, reducing carbon emissions, supporting the switch away from animal protein, which aligns strongly with consumer trends, and it's underpinned by creating high quality bio-based jobs. So I want to finish, or I want to revert to how this impacts on the future of protein. Microprotein is undoubtedly one of the main options to enable a sustainable transition to the future protein. We do not crave a dystopian world where it's the sole choice, but we do see it as the most advantaged solution to meet, to meet the ever spiraling increase in demands. I've quoted BCG's estimate for the increase in market demand, and that equates to a suggestion that non-animal protein moves from 2%, around 2% of the market now, to closer to 10% by 2035. And this estimate is at the bottom end of predictions from wide range of experts, including McKinsey, A.T. Kearney, Barclays and more. The median estimate would be closer to double that prediction, around 20%, and the high-end estimates are more in line with the view that the fate of animal farming may be closely linked to that of the combustion engine, with 40% of protein demand being non-animal based by 2035. If that was to happen, we may have enough soil to be scalable, but the supply of other pulses such as pea simply do not exist, and plant options would certainly face some limitations in scale. In contrast, if we were to replicate the $300 billion that was invested in renewable energy in 2019, we would readily provide food security with a non-animal option that, would, that could account for 30 to 40% of the market 
as indicated here. Therefore, as a summary of the merits of microprotein to support the protein future, it's certainly scalable uh, using any locally grown feedstock. It's apl applicable in any geography. Um, it addresses food security by producing locally to the consumer need. It's more technology ready and it is more capital efficient than the most than almost all of the alternatives hy hypothesized. If I was true to myself at this stage, I would love to share you some food because I think nothing transforms a conversation like this than food. But in the absence of food, I simply share enough view of how we grow scale to address the protein market. We'll start with capacity in Europe, but we fully acknowledge the need to expand this into wider territories and we will do this in collaboration as is the only way we will achieve this big task. I thank you all for your time. Um, very pleased to address any questions. And again, I thank you, Bridge to Food and to Gerard for uh, the opportunity to speak today. I see a question, uh, Jim, from uh, Lara Tiro. She's from um, Canada and she's asking about the nutrition and the labeling ingredient statement in nutritionals for Abanda. Hi, Lara. Um, great question. And um, Abunda Mike Protein has regulatory approvals in in about 37 markets now. It was originally in uh, in Europe under EFSA. Or, um, it's, it's, it's Food Canada, I think, came late to the party, but it, it was approved in food, um, in Canada several years back. Um, so it's back a pack declaration is Mike Protein small m. Um, I think there are more Mike Proteins coming, and I think with with that it will invite maybe uh, some clarification to ensure we give great consumer understanding. Um, in terms of nutrition, it supports a high in fiber and a high in protein claim. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question with the with the start line that is in back of packet, small m microprotein. Um, mm -hmm. um, there are another two questions, uh, Jim. For, firstly, from Marcel van der Vaart. He's with Kosen Agriculture Company. You may know them. And uh, um, he's asking, are there currently enough initiatives, enough, enough initiatives in producing microprotein to reduce the future need projected? No, I think it's a great question. And uh, I have to regret that there's not. Um, I think we are not. I think we are with our big, hairy, audacious goal of a million tons within 10 years. I think we account for around about 2% of what the market says is required. Um, and I see the protein brewery and others who are on this call, and I say, let's. We all need to move faster because I think uh, collectively, if the predictions of the experts is correct, then we are not enough, and I don't think the industry is yet moving at the pace that can keep pace with that demand. Um, and certainly, for enough's point of view, we are blessed to be supported by some great investors. We will have that 10,000 tons in place this year. Mm -hmm. And we will start to invest for the second line before the first one is operational. But um, you know, my I guess soundbite is enough is not enough. <laughs> That's a good summary. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a question here, uh, also from Uwe. Uh, he's asking um, Uwe Richter. He's with the Gaia company. Can you um, make sure the media market is? How do you uh, um, ensure that the media market is growing aligned with the fermentation market in terms of the consumer adoption? That's probably the question. Consumer concerns and things like that. If uh, if that's not right, uh, Uwe, please correct me. But uh, what do you think, Jim? Um, so I, I guess the I think it's an interesting point that um, the top down views of the market is it's growing massively and is the bottom up aspect keeping pace. And I think we all know in our own markets, we see more products on shelf. We've seen good products on shelf and bad products on shelf. But um, mm -hmm. and it, when we we collectively have to avoid disappointing consumers um, because mm -hmm. we can turn them off. But I think if we make great tasting food, then we keep consumers happy. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the uh, taste, price, convenience uh, is the simple answer of if we've got taste, price, convenience, we'll, we'll do it right. Um, <laughs> but let's not um, upset consumers with, I, th I think consumers have been disappointed over the years. Um, they've not, there's, there's been a range of mediocre products out there. Uh, mm -hmm. but well, I didn't answer your question, then please let's uh, pick it up offline yeah. because uh, I think, I'll enjoy uh, the conversation all day. Yeah, go to the chat. You'll see it's slightly different. Sorry, uh, Uwe. But there is meanwhile another um, question from uh, Deb Anderson from the Protein Brewery. Huh? Uh, 
asking about should should all microprotein companies label as such like they just find corn meaty etc all have different labeling on pack is there think, a common i think the that we we need to be legal legal be safe and inform consumers the best of our ability um i think there is uh enough and abunda use a similar strain as has been used and has been consumed within the product corn and therefore has a mic has, has used that back of pack nomenclature um i think we we need to give consumers everything they need i think our our uh if we if we go for shorthand as marketing then somewhere then it will cause consumers some concern um so in terms of the alternative, I see the question, nature's fine, meaty, etc. Uh, I think we are creating slightly different ingredients each, and I think we need to make sure that we collectively give the consumer enough back of pack information such that the regulator does not find it a problem. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, maybe the question is also when you look uh, in 15 years, when you look back, will then the consumers have uh, instead of soy or pea, the word microprotein in their mind after all the introductions and one overall word that could capture all the things that are, of course, with different strains and conditions. But I think I think it's not the best word. Um, I think we, the people in this audience will, will agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think there's some examples in the US of uh, nutritional fungal protein. Uh, I don't think in Europe we would be allowed to say that, but I think it sounds it sounds more uh, food like than microprotein. But um, again, we have to work within the constraints and uh, yeah, food right. constraints. Yeah. So so um, Anne is a is a guest. Uh, to all of you in the audience, I would like to ask when you ask a question, uh, add the name of your company or organization, and maybe where you're from. It ma makes it easier. Anne has got a question about uh, Abanda and high extrusion processing. Um, I love this question. Uh, I think legacy wise, uh, microprotein, which has a natural high, is naturally high in, fi high in fiber and therefore has natural texture, uh, did not turn itself towards high moisture extrusion, but we thought, why not? Um, and the answer is uh, high moisture extrusion can can do to microprotein what it does to mm -hmm. other protein sources, which is mm -hmm. to give firmer fiber formation. Um, not decrying high moisture extrusion, we, the, the fundamentals of fermentation, it's a fairly simple process, a continuous process, low resource, low, relatively low resources. And uh, I think if we can, Maybe uh, we can, we, we we do not rely on high moisture extrusion to get that biting texture. There are some other processes which can achieve it. And again, working with likes of Wageningen, we are, as part of the project, we'll, we will look at the full range of opportunities there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. If you have a fantastic rest of the morning or maybe a dinner, wherever you are, and hope to see you soon again. And thank you once again.